and it was this fine balance. We were on a, a relay pump um, and so on. So, I mean, my line, I took pictures. If you go to our social media, you'll actually see the actual intake, the five inch intake and that a master intake was sucking on itself. But I had, I was carrying this very fine balance of, of you know, a tower ladder, a, a rear mount straight stick and multiple hand lines. I mean, I was at capacity. I was pumping over capacity. I figured out we were pushing about 1760 on a 1500 GPM pump. Sure. So, you know, which obviously, you know, if the pump's in good, you know, operating condition, you know, that's not an issue. You know, you can over pump, you can sure. definitely maximize. Um, but man, I was teetering. So everyone, Jeremy with National Fire Radio. Welcome back for another episode of Apparatus Innovations. Today on the Zoom, I have Greg Geske from Waterist Company. He is the Director of Sales and Marketing. And I have Jason Naraki, the Sales Manager for North America, or Global, I should say, right? Global? North America. North America. All right. I was Greg's trying to give you, guy. Trying to give you okay. an upgrade. No worries, brother. <laughs> Listen, gentlemen, I appreciate you uh, joining me for such short notice. Um, and short notice is because this past Sunday, we put out a uh, Sunday night discussion on the National Fire Radio social media pages in regards to wet or dry pumps. How do you store your pumps? We want to get the conversation going with our apparatus innovation page. What we like to do is share the tips, tricks, and hacks and how people do it across the country. Because a lot of times we find that people think they have the answer or know the answer when in fact uh, they're listening to myth or lore or the fire, you know, the, uh, the, the apparatus bay floor chatter from the guys that have been there for 50 years. But in fact, they might not have the accuracy in, in giving the, the correct information. And so a very simple conversation of how do you store your pumps wet or dry. And so what I wanted to do is go right to the source. And so uh, water is company, uh, a global leader in fire suppression since 1886. I took that right off the website. I did a little bit of homework. Greg, talk to me. The importance of wet or dry pumps, does it really matter? And, and that's kind of our point. I guess we, we kind of simplify it. It doesn't matter to us. And we do not portray any other other than if you run wet pumps, you should probably engage your pump when it gets below freezing and circulate water. If you're running a dry pump, you should be checking to make sure that your pump is a true dry pump. And that's the biggest thing is people, you know, they drain it, uh, they close the drains, and they assume that they have a dry pump. Well, if your tank pump leaks, if your tank fill leaks, if your pump cooling line leaks, uh, over time, now your pump might be half full. And at that point, a half full pump is actually going to freeze quicker than a, a, a pump full of water. So um, we're good either way with it. Um, you know, the best thing is if you had it dry, um, but it should be completely dry. Um, there's pluses and minuses of both. Uh, but, you know, if, if you do run a dry pump, then you do have to get rid of that air pocket that's in there, whether that's hitting the primer when you open the tank to pump. Um, and then people that leave their uh, drain valve close or open, for example, so that they get draining all the time so that you don't have water in there. If they open the tank to pump and that water hits the drain valve before they close it, is right. it possible that it's frozen in the open position? So um, that's the big thing is if, if you run a wet pump, fine. If you run a dry pump, make sure that it is dry. Um, so environmental, the environmental concern is really what then dictates the operation of whether you want to store your pumps dry or wet, right? So, you know, where I am in the Northeast in New Jersey, typically, you know, they're wet in the warm months and then we drain them in the, uh, in the winter months to ensure. Um, you, you did mention the priming aspect, right? So, if you keep the pumps wet, so there's been some conversation in the in the comments too about uh, mostly what I found was most departments, their SOGs do say keep their pumps wet. Do you keep with a wet pump, do you keep your tank to pump valve open or closed? What's the recommendation? No, normally we leave it, uh, my own department, I guess, we, we leave the tank to pump valve as closed just because uh, it, it looks silly as you drive around with that, with the, uh, a uh, tank to pump lever open, uh, sticking out. 
Um, some uh, fire departments I know where they leave them open, you can you can have it set up the other way that it's right. pulled to close and, yep. and pushed into open. But on my department, it's pulled to open, so we leave them closed. Um, it is the first step that we do after engaging the pump, getting that water in, water out, the water moving. Uh, you know, we get out to the panel and and uh, my own department, we're in in uh, western uh, a suburb of uh, Minneapolis, so. Uh, we're a cold environment and we yeah. run wet pumps and people say, well, how do you know to, when to engage the pump? And uh, basically we keep it simple. Hey, if it's below freezing, you know, and, and really it's going to take a long time for a pump to freeze if it's 30, 30 degrees out. But I know if it's going to be below 32, our SOPs are, we, we stop, we engage the pump, open the tank to pump, crack our tank fill. You don't want to open that all the way. And then I usually bring it up off of idle, uh, you know, 50, 70 pounds of pressure. Um, okay. But so, yeah, you uh, we'll leave the, uh, again, the tank pump valve closed, but it's the first step I do as soon as I engage the pump. And, and really that's the other downfall of running a dry pump is when you do first engage it, you know, uh, you, you typically do that in the cab and you get out and you open up your tank pump. Well, it is going to be running for amount of time and you have to remember that the mechanical seal and the packing are both dry so you don't you want to keep that that period of time very short okay and then in regards to the mechanical seal and pump and, and packing it's typically one or the other right you're not going to have a seal on one end and packing on the other so you either have a pack pump or mechanical seal what not to get too into the weeds because i want to focus on a couple other things but what is the dictate who dictates that pump design, can it be, would you consider the mechanical seals an upgrade to the packing? And if so, why would you prefer one over the other? Sure, so uh, it is, so on our on our dual eyed impeller uh, pumps, midship pumps that we have, for example, it is packing a standard on there and you have an option to go up the mechanical seal. That being said, um, there's probably about 65 to 70% of the, the pumps that we build in that are mechanical seal. Okay. And then the end suction pumps that we have, the mechanical seal is standard and we have no other options. So you have advantages and disadvantages of both. The mechanical seal doesn't have to be adjusted. You're not going right. to have water that's going to be leaking onto your floor um, it, where you have to adjust the, the packing. But yet the packing has a... A little bit more forgiveness if you run that pump dry and now you hit it with cold water there is right. no carbon rotating ring that you're yeah there's no shock to it right exactly yeah Here so we will take off of that though yeah, uh, just on a water standpoint sorry to interrupt you there no no uh, no go go please uh, our mechanical seals are silica carbide so they do have a higher uh i guess temperature rating so they don't more shock abrasion as, resistant shock as, well. as easily so yeah just wanted to take off of that no, that's great. No, that's good to know for sure. They are upgraded sealed bases. They're not carbon versus ceramic. They are carbon versus silcar or, and so on. So yeah, I am aware. That's that's a very good point, Jason. When we talk about then the, the packing's a little more forgiving, let's talk about a dry pump storage then, right? Because what I find with dry pump storage, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this might be something that is one of those misnomers, but you know, if you have hard water, could you potentially have more buildup on the wear parts from say calcium or grit, if the pump is dry and there's no water within, would it would the pump tend to dry out and cause any more buildup of say plaque or anything like that on the say on the impeller or on the wear parts? I, I you know I don't know that and I don't okay. know that we've ever done a study on that. I think you're gonna if if you let it dry long enough, you know, in most most departments they might do a truck check. Um, you know, once a week, might do it once a month or something where they're actually at that point, then they probably should introduce water again when they're doing their truck check because they're checking other things on it. But, um, you know, if it does dry out over a certain amount of time, you might get uh, more leakage until that uh, moisture gets in there and kind of fills in, you know, and, and expands that if there's some shrinkage. I don't, I don't know that you would, my own personal thing, I don't know that you would get any more uh, buildup of calcium. Okay. I know where I am, we have very hard water and, uh, you know, and then multiply that with new construction everywhere. You have a lot of sediment that gets into the, into the domestic water supply, uh, which then sits in our tanks. And so 
Um, how often should we be draining our pumps? I mean, say a volunteer department that's not going to fires every day, that has a, a drill night once a week, like an organized drill night and so on, on, a, on, a, on an infrequent basis department, how often they, should they be draining the, the pump cavity uh, to flush or back flush the system to, to clean the sediment? So, so typically where the sediment and whether you, if you have a two-stage pump or a, a, a single-stage pump, the big thing is just kind of actuating everything. Uh, so, you know, if you are, if you are running a dry pump, for example, you are going to want to check that uh, to make sure that it doesn't have water in it. So you're probably going to periodically want to just yeah. open up the drain, but um, it's a good idea to open up that drain to exercise that drain during every truck check because any sediments you talked about the corrosion or the sand and stuff um, we've had it before where our, our cable operated manifold drain valve for example that uses a, a piston in there um, you know they don't exercise it that sand gets stuck in there now somebody puts a foot on the panel and pulls it you break the cable so you're, you're better off that you do exercise that during your truck check and at least open the drain, whether you have a wet or a dry pump, to, to flush out the, the sediments that, that are going to settle down into that drain. Same thing okay. goes for a, if you have a two-stage pump, um, the transfer valve is located low in the pump. So during your truck check, while flowing water, you're going to want to exercise that from, uh, from series to, to uh, uh, parallel or volume to pressure. And uh, so that you're flushing out any sediment that's down in those areas also. Okay. And as you, as you entered that conversation with a two-stage pump, um, I'd, I'd love to hit on that conversation real quick because I, you know, coming up through the fire service, all of our apparatus at one time were two-stage pumps, right? Pressure and volume. Correct. Now all of our new builds are single stage, right? They're one impeller. Is that because of advancements? It, it seems that a two-stage pump is not as common as it once was. Is that because of technology and advancement? Well, it, it really, they started with two-stage pumps because we did not have the horsepower back when we had, uh, the, okay. we okay. had gas engines and stuff. So a two-stage pump is more efficient across a broader range, of course, and it's more efficient for those low flows with higher pressures you have it in series. Um, really, the reason, the big biggest reason we sell two-stage pumps now is because of the high rises where you... Uh, you know, you're capable of doing 600 gallons per minute at 600 sure. PSI. Sure. Okay. That's yeah, your typical big city pumps, you know, you're looking at 300, in excess of 300 PSI for your single stages. So you're, you're typically looking at, you know, 40 stories, anything beyond that, uh, because of head pressure and friction losses, you're going to go into that two stage journey. So. Oh, for sure. And then, and then on top of that too, I mean, you know, you guys do multiple stage also. So you go to a three stage, I know, the FDNY, Jersey City, New Jersey, they have high pressure, you know, apparatus that are pumping vertical, um, you know, for their application. So I know that does exist for sure. Great. So let me ask you this. This is a, this is a question I have uh, just in, in regards to pumping, but the tank to pump valve, when we switch from the tank to dedicated water supply coming in, are we closing that valve? Does it matter? I do not close it. Okay. Just for that reason of, of if let's say I'm, I'm doing something else at the panel, for some reason, my hydrant uh, pressure goes away or drops off. As long as I have it open, there is uh, in the 1991 standard, NFPA standard, it was required that you have a tank to pump check valve in that tank to pump line. Okay. In that tank to pump check valve now, as soon as I uh, open my hydrant, that tank to pump valve is gonna slam closed so it's not backfilling or that pressure is not going into my tank. It's basically protecting the tank. But now I have that protection, that tank to pump check valve is there. If the pressure goes away from the hydrant, what it's gonna do is just open that tank to pump check valve back up and I have my, my head pressure from my tank that's gonna supply right. the water for me. Um, you'll find that most of the check valves also have a hole in them. And for that reason, we get calls a lot of times for people that do leave their tank to pump chuck or their tank to pump valve line. <laughs> Sorry. The, oh, you're fine. Pump, you're fine. Tank to pump valve open. Um, when you hook up to the hydrant, it pushes a little bit of water back in. So the question, why is the tank overflowing? You know, maybe I maybe I'm not. Uh, I have a tank fill closed. 
there is a small hole in that. And the reason for that hole is uh, if you deadhead water and it gets up to a boiling temperature, it has a vent path of yeah. that check valve. That makes so. sense. Okay. And so when you talk about overheating, right, I know we talked about weather. Weather is a concern for sure, right? And that dictates really about the pump care and, and the preventative we do to making sure that we're not freezing our pumps, right? Uh, but it can go the other way too, overheating, right? Um, if you could just hit on a couple things there, things to consider, recirculation, things like that, just a couple yep. tips. Yep, so uh, the two biggest things, you know, years ago on the apparatus, you'd have a, a pump cooler line. That may be a three-eighths or half-inch line that went from pump discharge up to pump intake. Right. Um, but we're back to the tank. Now, a lot of the OEMs got rid of that and your, your tank fill line will say tank fill and pump cooler on it. The problem with that was, is a little is good, a lot is too much. Okay. Um, if you actually take, and, and uh, we have departments that complain, they say, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll engage the pump, open the tank to pump all the way, which you should do, and they'll open their tank fill all the way. Well, usually that's a two inch valve. If you try to pump a two inch opening at 60 PSI, it's trying to pump well, a thousand gallons yeah. per minute, right? Yeah. Most tank to pump valves will only give you, uh, you know, 600 to 800 at the most from tank. So you start putting your pump in a cavitation position. So uh, you want to, if you, you know, and anytime I do training with operators, as soon as you engage that pump, you want water in, water out. So uh, open your tank to pump all the way, crack that tank fill. And when I talk about cracking it, it might, might only be a quarter, an eighth to a quarter open. Right. That's good. Okay, good to know. Very good to know. Uh, and then let's talk about, you brought up cavitation. Let's talk about cavitation. I just pumped the fire ooh, a month or two ago where I was putting out more than I was bringing in. And it was this fine balance. We were on a, a relay pump um, and so on. So, I mean, my line, I took pictures. If you go to our social media, you'll actually see the actual intake, the five inch intake and that a master intake was sucking on itself. But I had I was carrying this very fine balance of, uh, you know, a tower ladder, uh, uh, a rear mount straight stick and multiple hand lines. I mean, I was at capacity. I was pumping over capacity. I figured out we were pushing about 1760 on a 1500 GPM pump. Sure. So, you know, which obviously, you know, if the pump's in good, you know, operating condition, you know, that's not an issue. You know, you can over pump, you can sure. definitely maximize. Um, but man, I was teetering. So, just talk about cavitation. That could be dangerous for the pump, though, too, no? Sure, sure. Uh, that's, you know, there's two things. And, and the one thing that I, I wanted to bring up, I forgot about uh, yeah. overheating. So I want to bring that overheating a little bit. The big thing we worry about in overheating is, is not the equipment as much as the firefighters. Um, you know, you, you dead had that pump and then somebody goes up and tries to wash their hands or we're trying to do decon and all of yeah. a sudden we're putting scalding water on them. So that is the important thing is keeping that water moving all the time. And then monitoring, you know, there's uh, the old thing is you, you can put your hand on the, on the steamer connection on the, on the pump and you're always going to feel how yeah. hot that water is getting in the pump. You gotta make sure you take the glove off first because if you can feel through the glove, it's too hot at that point. But yeah, right. there are there are alarms out there. There's overheat protection devices that could be installed that automatically vent from the pump too. So and where do they what's what's the operating temperature that's like normal, like one twenty like anything under like 120 is yeah, you might it depends on how much water you're moving. Okay. Um what it is is at, at 140 degrees is where our uh, basically our overheat protection valve opens and dumps the either atmosphere or back to the tank. Um, if it gets up to 160, it's actually going to uh, uh, maybe have an audible or a light that's telling right. you that it's overheating. Um, okay. So that 140, you can handle without getting scalded. And that's kind of where that point in 140 is really something where you can put your hand on, it's going to feel warm, but you don't have to pull it away. Gets above 140, you, you have to pull it away because it's going to cause pain. Got it. Got it. Um, okay, so getting back to yeah. Sorry, sorry to. to no, no, no. You're good. Portion. You're good. So our next portion we were talking about cavitation. 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 Yeah. So <laughs> you you said one thing. You said you were flowing more water than you could get to it, which is is not possible. But you're attempting well, you, to do that. Right. 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 You're yes. attempting to do. It, right. Which is the other reason why it's good to leave that tank pump valve open because yes. as that pressure drops, 
water is going to come in from the tank uh, to take care of that. Of course, yep. as an operator, I want to keep my tank full. So I would notice that that starts to drop down. Um, but yeah, you're going to get that cavitation and cavitation is going to show up in two things. You're going to see the, the negative drop, of course, on your, on your intake gauge. And you probably will see some jumping of the, the discharge gauge, you know, right. where it starts to drop as it starts to cavitate. So um, keep, there are things that uh, uh, as an operator, you can hear that cavitation, you're gonna watch it and watch it. Um, a lot of times in our training, we say, hey, you don't wanna go below 20 PSI on your, mm -hmm. your intake gauge. And, right. and that way, you know, there's been stories that, oh, if, if you go, too far, you're going to collapse uh, water heaters and stuff. Well, that's only if you were connected to the hydrant with a uh, hard suction hose, which not too many people do. So. Got it. But there is, there is uh, one of the governors that we released actually has an alarm. Uh, so if it sees more than 40 pounds of pressure coming in, it'll arm it. If it drops down below 20, and these are all settable, it'll uh, it'll indicate that you've got a low pressure alarm. So another okay. way that you can tell the operator that they might be entering in the cavitation area. Got it. Good. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the visual for me, I mean, you know, you can watch the gauges and you can listen. Um, yeah. You know, obviously when you're, when you're the chauffeuring, it's, it's all, it's all your senses are involved, but I like to always try to hook up to my panel instead of to a front or officer side or even rear intake, just because I get a good feel of that line coming in and uh and so on so that's that's just one of my little pet peeves you know um and so on and then the other issue is just uh what we talked about corrosion and, and contaminants right those are things that we got to be concerned with too that we talked about flushing the pump preventative maintenance things like that flushing the pump you know and the other thing the big thing is that uh galvanic corrosion that we get inside a pump too um and there you're going to look at uh, if your strainers or your screens on your intakes are made out of zinc, um, they're so serving two purposes. They stop foreign objects from getting inside the pump, but because they're made of zinc, they're also a sacrificial metal. Yeah. So right. uh, inspecting those and replacing them, um, you know, when parts of them start to break away or it starts to sacrifice itself, if you are having to replace those quite often, that's telling you that you've got some pretty active water. Yeah. And dissimilar metals in your in your pump, the iron areas are 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 going to get eaten away. So you want to protect that. We do have, and all the manufacturers have anodes that you can put in. It used right. to be anodes in the tank because it was a metal tank. So Wasn't that standard that. at one time? Like they, it might be. You know, I'm dating myself that I've been around long enough that it's been anodes, but I can't remember. Yeah, probably when it was still steel tanks, it was yeah, probably right. required to have anodes right. in there. But all the pump manufacturers do have anodes that can be put in the uh, pump itself. And then you would watch it basically when there's 50% of that anode gone, you can get rid of that. So um, that's one thing, the galvanic corrosion, um, you know, flushing your pumps or using them, back flushing them is even better. If you do have a two-stage pump, you want to make sure you uh, open up that, that uh, flat valve that's in the second stage. So you're flushing that side of it also. But, uh, um, that's always a good idea. Great. Well, listen, I know we're time is a uh, time is an issue today and, uh, you know, and so on. And I wanted to really hit on a couple key things that we talked about in that social media post that got a lot of play. I think there's going to be a lot of value that comes from this quick conversation that we had today. And gentlemen, I appreciate you, uh, on short notice, joining me to get the message out. Uh, Water is Pump Company. You guys have been doing this a very long time, and uh, it was a very knowledgeable and thorough conversation today. I appreciate both of you being here. Um, Jason, where can they find you? You guys have a YouTube page with some helpful hits, right, and so on. Where we do, yeah. We have Waterus University at www.waterusco.com. There's a Waterus University site where you can get in there and get all the intel. We can get into the cathodic protection of protecting your pumps and um we get into uh, you know overheating pumps, all those uh, things like that. There's a lot of the educational pieces that we put on there, and we're going to continue to grow that for that's great. For, all, for the benefit of all the firefighters. So yeah, great. I mean that's it, man. Becoming part of the community and sharing the knowledge, right? Manufacturers that want to educate the consumer are the manufacturers that step out and take the lead, right? So a better, you know, an educated consumer is a better firefighter and it's a better buyer, and uh, they build a better piece of equipment. So, uh, well gentlemen. Thank you for joining me, Greg. I appreciate your knowledge today. I really do. 
um, and so on. Jason, thank you for uh, joining me as well. You guys stay right here. We're just going to end the recording. Um, everybody, thanks for tuning into this episode of National Fire Radio's Apparatus Innovations. Waterus Pump Company. Check them out online. They're putting out some great products, educating firefighters uh, about their products and pumping in general. So, fellas, thanks for being here today. Thanks. Everybody be safe. Thank Peace you. Thank you.